Um, so our next highlight will be a panel about space outreach around the world, because I mean, our, everyone loves space. We heard it before. So let's see from different parts of the world uh, how space outreach is done there. So how do we communicate across borders and boundaries? And um, we will do an exploration of communication from the lens of international and intercultural differences. So we also hear some success stories, I hope. Um, please, everyone who is will not be on the panel or switch off your camera again or otherwise we have to do that um but it doesn't that that, that does not sound good or it does not feel good if you do so so with that i would like to call our on stage our nikita uh, miranda luna de urano her baker and i'm handing over to you and your host or for the next 25 minutes or and your host will be the wonderful rika valori so rika floor is yours Thank you, Torsten. Welcome back, everybody, and welcome to uh, the second panel for today. And today uh, we'll be talking about space outreach around the world. Uh, we have two wonderful speakers with us today. Uh, Nikita, who is the co-founder of SSERD in India. And we have Herb Baker, who recently retired from NASA after 42 years of service. Thank you both for being here today. Um, just before we start, I'd like to quote uh, Eli Wiesel, who is a Holocaust survivor and was later a Nobel laureate. He said, action is the only remedy to indifference, the most insidious danger of all. And talking about space outreach today, and we've been talking about representation, diversity, and all of these wonderful things, but the action seems to be missing. Um, where do you think uh, the action needs to take place, especially with space outreach. And uh, Nikita, would you like to start? So basically, space outreach comes from within, right? Like when you find that something is missing or people should know some information that they were supposed to know, that's where it actually starts off. And uh, at the same time, you also must have someone to listen to you. And when you find those set of um, audience who are like eagerly waiting to know or who really never heard of something, that's where the outreach starts. The outreach can also start in a very small way that I could have just one small kid coming up, coming and asking something about space and you answer that question. I think that's where the outreach starts. That's amazing. Herb, what do you think? Well, so for me, I, I think it's more a case of just being open and available to those groups and people who would like to hear uh, my story and, and, and what I like to talk about, about NASA and space. Uh, I, I was telling the, the Clubhouse group just now that uh, uh, a friend uh, on Clubhouse uh, in Italy uh, wanted to have a two-hour Q&A session with with me, and uh, I had to use it, or we had to use a translator, but uh, that was fine. You know, I was happy to do it, and it it made it possible for those uh, folks in in Italy who didn't speak English to participate. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes groups, uh, uh, for example, I, I I was was telling you all earlier, uh, a group of uh, underprivileged kids in in, in a state in the middle of the, of the US who's not near anywhere near a, 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 a US space agency invited me up to a space camp for a week. And so I went up uh, and, and spent a week uh, talking to young underprivileged uh, kids about NASA and space. And so, you know, it would be easy to say, oh, that's too much trouble or that's too hard or, or I don't want to do that. But uh, I, I especially like uh, looking out for opportunities like that. Yeah, I think that's very important to be able to take out time from your own personal uh, life and go and educate these kids who don't have access, uh, which brings me to a very nice thing that you brought up. You said you were talking to people in Italy and you had a translator. Um, 
Have you both ever had an experience where you had to either talk in a vernacular language or you had to choose an unconventional way to uh, communicate science? Nikita, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so this was uh, in 2018 when we were invited to Sri Lanka, wherein over there, the students mostly speak their uh, language. And we were invited to talk about the advancements that, that were happening here in India and share more information. And then we're trying to speak and then the students are unable to grasp what we're telling in English. So at that time, we really had to, um, you know, um, have someone who knows the language as well as English and, and try to say uh, what we were telling. Similarly, um, we, we also have this problem within India because, you know, in India, you go every 200 kilometers, the language slightly starts changing and every region has its own regional language. So, so wherever you would go and particularly to rural places, you would need someone to translate or someone to explain in their own language. And yes, explaining in their own language actually uh, kind of leaves a lot, um, a lot of good impact because the students can understand what we're talking. That's, that's the experience that I have had with the language. Uh, yeah, the one I described is the only time I can think of really having to, to do, do something like that. Uh, English is spoken widely across the world, of course. Uh, there was one other time it, that comes to mind, uh, a journalist from Poland wanted to do an interview with me for um, the, the Poland uh, version of Business Insider, but she spoke English. So, so she happened to be in Houston and we met up and, and did a nice long interview. And so she published it in, in, in Polish and, and I was able to translate it to read it later, but uh, uh, you know, it, that was easy for me because she did all of the work. So what was that one experience that both of you had that kind of made you feel like you were doing the right thing? Because doing space outreach and communication is a lot of work, but sometimes you come across these really wonderful experiences and you have these touching moments. Would you like to share with us a story uh, about when you really felt like you had changed somebody's life? Would you like to go first? Uh, okay, well, I, I, I go back to the, the one that, that stands out to me the most, uh, having the largest impact probably was the one I mentioned, at the, the, the week-long space camp with the underprivileged kids because there, there were so many of them. It was, you know, uh, again, a, a full week. And, and I recalled someone mentioning to me uh, how thankful they were that uh, I was able to come because those children never would otherwise have had a chance to, to meet and talk with, with someone who uh, had worked for NASA and, and had those experiences. But uh, I, I also do, uh, uh, e even if uh, a, a, a parent with a, uh, I can think of a couple of examples with, you know, five, six, seven-year-old kids who are interested in science and they contact me and ask me if I would talk to their kids. And so we set up a Zoom and in their living room, you know, with the family. And uh, uh, the, the parents are always very thankful uh, to have that opportunity. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I love especially talking with kids. Uh, all it takes is, you know, the, the story about a, a, a pin or a jacket uh, is a spark that gets someone interested in science or STEM or space for, for the rest of their life. And, and so I'm always hoping that just if I can reach that one one person, uh, that it's all worthwhile. So uh, to go to go from my end, um, so I've been into space education and outreach since like five six five six years uh, from now. Uh, as in uh, 2016, that was like when I was a student. Um, I started off with telling students or telling my friends about education and everything. And then um, we started off SSCID, which, which, is an, which is actually a not-for-profit organization. And a lot of pressure comes from family as well to run an NGO and like being a really good student who can 
get really good job, but I started off with a not-for-profit organization. There was a lot of pressure. But then I kept on going with the goal of telling about space to people across the world. What just makes me keep going is that whenever we do these programs, there's at least one or two students who come back to us and say, Mom, I want to become like you. Mom, I think I will become this. And, and the way they come and respond back to us, I think that just makes us feel, okay, whatever we're doing is good. And that's that's more than enough. So that's kind of small, small uh, happiness that drives us from doing what we're doing. At the same time, the students whom we would have taught like four or five years back, they come back to us telling that, okay, you know, we attended your program and now we're, you know, almost going to achieve our goals. So that just makes us feel so good and like, okay, we've done good work. That's the only thing which just keeps, keeps us, at least me as a social entrepreneur to keep going. That's really incredible. Uh, we actually have two really interesting questions in the chat box and I think we should spend time answering those. Uh, the first question is, what responsibility do agencies like NASA or ISRO have for promoting space outside of their own countries? Herb, do you want to go first? Um, sure. And I, 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 I always have to be careful after having worked for NASA, saying now with uh, prefacing that by I can't speak for NASA, but uh, you know, uh, as far as responsibility, I, I'm not sure they have a responsibility because it's a government agency other than to the citizens of the United States. But <clears throat> to the essence of the question, really, uh, I, I think NASA actually does a, a, a wonderful job with their social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, maybe Instagram, uh, uh, YouTube. Uh, I, I, I've always been actually impressed with, with uh, especially how, how willing the astronauts who are very busy uh, to, to spend time sharing stories and photos and videos of, of what it's like to, to be in space. And, and so I, I actually think that uh, I, I personally, as an individual, believe that NASA you know, should share uh, because they have access to, to people and stories and things that others don't have. Uh, but I think they do a very good job of that myself. Nikita, do you want to chime in? Yeah, I think to the question that um, Charlie asked, I feel NASA gives out the information very much uh, openly for everyone. And that's something that everyone is aware of, you know? That's the reason why everyone like NASA. Now coming to ISRO, uh, years back, I think there was no much information that was going out in, other than, okay, there's a launch. There's this particular launch and these are the rockets. But then since three, four years, um, ISRO has been doing really well with the outreach. They come up with different activities and they gather students a specific program they plan for outreach uh, activities, particularly for school going students. So I think ISRO is also doing well. Again, that's limited for Indian students for now. But I think uh, there was a new, uh, there must, I mean, this must or this would happen in the future. There is uh, a TV channel that ISRO is working on, which is basically for outreach probably that must be open for everyone and yeah from there everyone would get information about what's happening in ISO and, and the outreach work yeah that's that's really nice I think ISRO is also starting to branch out very soon and try to decentralize a lot of other things um both of you are global science communicators. You've been interacting with different audiences, uh, both in terms of where they come from, what countries, their culture, what age group. How does your communicating style change when you interact with these different audiences? Mikita, do you want to start? 
Oh, I, I think it remains same wherever you go, whatever audience you would find. Like, for example, sometimes we will have to interact with the very young school going students or like five year old. And then uh, sometimes you would have to go and meet someone who is in high school. And then we also do a lot of outreach activities for common public as in they might not even know what what we're talking about at the same time we have to convey the information uh, and this happens during the eclipse because uh, we here in india most of them still have that superstitious beliefs of uh, eclipse and we try to uh, you know remove those thoughts from them so we kind of reach out to different type of people and for us uh, enthusiastic people is something that we look at and whomever it is we just go to their level of you know understanding be it technical non-technical uh, or in their own language and and yeah there, there, there was one time where a, a kid who's two and a half year old coming up coming and asking a lot of space related question i mean that student doesn't even know how to pronounce those words like big, big words like asteroids and things, but still ready to ask questions and trying to answer if we ask any question. So you just need to go to their level and understand and explain. You know, I think there's one, uh, one, one great saying uh, by one of the great uh, teacher, Richard Feynman, right? He says, uh, if you're teaching something and a five-year-old doesn't understand, then you should like literally try out as many times as possible to make that kid understand. And that's what we, uh, all the um, communicators do is what I believe. Well, so I, I do obviously have to tailor my presentations uh, sometimes uh, depending on the audience, uh, because I talked, again, I mentioned literally five, six, seven year old children or third graders, or middle school, or high school, or, or uh, astronomy clubs, or space societies. And so, you know, they, there, there is a, a, a bit of just the maturity of the audience. But one, one story that reminds me of, I, I like to tell is, so throughout much of the last 10 or 20 years, I, I, a lot of the groups and people I've talked to weren't even, sometimes the, the, especially the children weren't even alive for the last space shuttle mission, right? And or I, I, I was working for the, the media for Apollo 11. So, you know, I, I go back to the, the lunar landings and, and I recall uh, being asked to speak to a retirement home, an assisted living home. And I'm having this really nice discussion and talking about the early days of Apollo and, and the, the, the people there are telling me stories. And it finally dawned on me that, oh my gosh, everyone in this room was actually alive and remembers those Apollo missions. It was the first time in my life I had ever talked to a group where everyone there actually, you know, experienced those uh, Apollo missions. Yeah, that must have been pretty incredible to watch them go on that mission. Um, and we've been talking about audiences and you've spoken about how you interact with different age groups, what you've been doing. Um, but with the pandemic, you've obviously had to adapt. And I know Herb is a superstar on social media. And how has that change been? You went from looking at Apollo missions with computers that were the size of huge rooms, and now you're just on your phone connecting with thousands of people across the world. Um, how did you adapt and how do you keep your audience engaged? Well, you know, it's certainly not something I ever envisioned doing while I was working for NASA. Again, in my age group, most of the, the my friends are not as involved in social media as I am. I just happen to love it. Uh, I, first of all, I, I I, I'm an extrovert. Uh, I, I love talking to people, interacting with people, meeting new people. And um, so uh, this, is, this has actually been, uh, you know, uh, 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 a benefit for me in, in ways that I, I, with the Zoom and, and Google Hangout and all these other methods, <laughs> Instagram Lives, uh, that I can reach audiences that I otherwise wouldn't be able to reach. But it, again, I started to say it never occurred to me 
that when I retired, I would be doing this. And I just happened to kind of fall into it. You know, again, uh, like I said, I, I, I do enjoy social media and uh, uh, just recently joined Clubhouse and happy, happy to have, have done that. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it, what's interesting is I don't have to do any, you know, advertising or publicizing. There's, there's so many people who, when I post a photo or a story or a picture from NASA, especially, you know, the early uh, Apollo or shuttle days, I, I, I get such a response and, there, and there's just any number of people who, who contact me and, and say, hey, would you talk to my group or would you talk to my kids or, you know, would you do a, a, a YouTube video for me or, or talk to, uh, do a video for college students about what it's like to, to work in the space industry and, and I've never turned anyone down. Uh, one other thing that, that 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 made me think of too is I don't know I, about anyone else, but I I don't charge. I, I, a lot of times someone will contact me and says, you know, we'd really love for you to talk to our group, but we don't have much of a budget. And I said, well, no, that's not a problem. I don't charge. I don't I don't do this for money. I just do it for the love of it because again, there's there's nothing I would rather do than that's why I'm here today than than talk to people about NASA and space. That's so incredible. I should really get my grandparents on social media as well. <laughs> they refuse to. But Nikita, what about you? I mean, SSCRD was on the ground for so long. And not only were you doing outreach, but you were also educating students. You had courses running for them. How did you manage that shift? And um, how do you kind of use media as a tool today to really help kids learn around you? Sure. In the very beginning uh, of our SCCRD journey, and until before COVID, uh, we were all like, okay, you know what, space education, and we are focusing on hands-on education, for which we want all the students to be with us, because we want students to build models, learn a lot of skills, like team building, uh, whatnot. But then COVID came, and we were like, okay, because from past two years, we were requested for online programs and we kept on telling no, we don't believe in online programs and everything. But then when COVID came in, we really had to shift uh, immediately. But then it's not that we never had experience. As I had told you earlier, we had SSCRD Philippines branch, which we actually started everything virtually. We gathered all the volunteers virtually. We used to train them from here and they used to do the work over there. So it's not that we were not new, but then we didn't want it to do. But then when COVID came, we were like, okay, within 15 days, we had to change all our programs to virtual programs. And 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 the and I think it turned out to be very good for us because we had uh, in in past four years, we've reached out to over like 20,000 students. But within one year, we were able to reach like 35,000 plus students. And not just in India, but across the world. We had students joining in from like 50 plus, 60 plus countries. And, and like, that was wonderful. And uh, we used to gather the speakers from various organizations, various institutions. Um, we also had astronaut Nicole start with us. And then we also used to have scientists from Israel. So we used to like literally gather people from different backgrounds and share their experience with our space staff. We used to teach uh, all our, um, you know, courses online. Again, we had 10 days of free uh, online space program where that's when we had like uh, thousands of students joining in from across the world. World Space Week, again, was completely online because every year we do it in a different way. I think every event we did, from April 1st of 2020 till date is like online. And somewhere, something that I feel bad is we've reached out to so many thousands of students, but how many do I know? Very few. And that's, that's something that makes me feel bad because 
until uh, COVID-19, I literally know every student who had come to our program, we spoke, we interact, but then online programs doesn't lead to that much of interaction. And we don't even know like who is over there behind the screen. So one way that kind of makes me feel bad as a communicator, but otherwise, I think online programs are like really good to reach out to more and more people to do incredible things. Yeah. That's wonderful. I hope everyone in the audience is also getting vaccinated and that we can all meet in person very soon and you will be able to interact with everybody again. Uh, Herb, there is a specific question for you. Uh, so they ask, uh, what would you say to those that may be doing SciComm but have lost faith in their ability to have an impact in recent months? I'm sorry, to have an impact in what? In, in the recent months, I think oh. in, in the view of COVID. <clears throat> well, um, <laughs> and this applies to, to my whole life. I like to, to say never give up, right? Um, and, and to some extent also, you, you know, it's certainly nice to feel like you're, you're making a contribution. Uh, uh, I, it's, I, I'm lucky because I'm retired. I, I don't have to do this for for my job. I don't have to work every day. I don't have to go to school every day. I, you know, I don't have to, to worry about doing this for income. I just do it because I love it. And and so, you know, I I, I maybe hate to say this, but to some extent, it, the that the the impact I'm having is secondary to to me just being able to. Uh, you know, enjoy doing this. And again, you know, just that one person, it, it doesn't matter if you're talking to, to 50 people and 45 of them aren't that interested. If there's one or four or five that, that are interested or, or that you can give that spark to, 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 to change their life or get them interested in STEM or NASA or space or something like that, it's all worthwhile to me. That's amazing. And I hope everyone kind of draws inspiration from that in the audience and also uh, tries to communicate about science and space around them. Uh, I know Kate started the other panel with an icebreaker question, but I'm probably going to try and end this panel with an icebreaker question. If both of you could go ahead and describe um, what science communication means to you, maybe in one word or two words, that would be really nice. Uh, Nikita, do you want to go first? I think that's my um, dream to tell more about space because that's been from my childhood. Yeah. Thank well, you. To, to me, the word would be inspiration. Um, you know, I, I, I've, I've met working at NASA, certainly met so many inspirational people and, and even some of the people in the audiences that I, I get to speak to, I hear stories about things that, that inspire me. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, just this, this being involved in space science communication in one way or another either inspires me or I hope inspires someone else every day. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you everyone for being uh, so attentive and thank you Nikita and Herb for being on our panel today. Uh, I will close the panel by just saying uh, rage, rage against the dying of the light. So thank you all for being here uh, and Torsten back to you.